theta, you get distance, which is a distance uh, between the two places. All right. So with that, they can actually just uh, measure a sim. This is a very simple measurement of how you get the radius of the Earth just by using uh, trigonometry. And in fact, that is how distance measurements are built up upon. We first start out with understanding the mathematics, and we use the mathematics to progress on. Okay. So of course, uh, things have uh, developed, and then we know that we can actually simply just measure uh, the circumference of the Earth just by using satellites. Right, just moving around, we can get very high resolution images, and it's going to be very simple. Right, so with satellites, you can measure distances uh, like uh, within the Earth, you know, uh, up to a certain, uh, in fact, quite good accuracy. Okay, so how? So we are going to go stage by stage. Okay, we are going to uh, go through a journey all the way from Earth to the distant universe. Okay, until the age of the universe, that's it. Okay, so stage one, I would say, is we want to make a trip around the Earth. Okay, I'm sure uh, many of you have taken flights, right? So you, we already know the circumference of the Earth. It's measured to be about 40,000 uh, kilometers across the entire Earth, right? Along the equator. So you know that the Earth is not exactly spherical, right? So it's slightly fatter in the center. So we're talking about this equator distance, right? So if we take an airplane, if we have the technology of having the airplane with like uh, a lot of fuel on it and you can fly non-stop around the Earth, it will take 45 hours okay, to make a round trip. That means you will fly from KIA, one whole round, 45 hours, you come back. Simple, right? So, so 45 hours is about two days, right? Just two days plus, maybe. Okay, so, so or less than two days. So it's not, it's not the long time, right? So you can physically travel around the Earth one round without much problem. Of course, that's not the fastest way to travel around. Okay, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope that's orbiting around the Earth can literally orbit the Earth at a speed of uh, 95 minutes. So within within uh, one and a half hours plus, this uh, Hubble Telescope can just go around the entire Earth. So that's very very fast. And how can it do so? Because it's orbiting so far up the atmosphere. There's no uh, resistance, and you know. So uh, based on your Newtonian mechanics, you can actually measure how fast this. Uh, 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 telescope is actually going around the Earth. Okay? So now we are going to go outside of the Earth. Okay? So we are interested in the nearest, next nearest object to the Earth, which is basically the Moon. Okay? So this is not drawn into scale, but the question is this how do we measure distances that are outside of the Earth? We may have, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a satellite earlier on. Remember, we can measure the distance in Earth, but how do we measure distances like this? I mean, you have to be a satellite that's that's moving around, you know, this entire system, which is not quite feasible. Doable, but not very feasible, right? So there is also another simple way. People have been doing what we call as lunar laser rendering. So what, how does this work? Basically, it's, it's the simple uh, property of light. We all know that the light travels at a constant speed, right? So when you send a laser all the way to the moon, it will bounce back, right? So when you when you detect the bouncing back and you detect that time involved, a very, very short time involved, it's simple. You can just take distance equals to speed multiplied by the time taken, right? So this is uh, stuff like the moon. So you realize that uh, uh, distances that are very, very close uh, nearby. Oh, I need to, okay. Okay, so, so for distances that are, that are nearby, you can actually use laser to, to do this kind of stuff, right? So, so never underestimate the, the power of laser. And in fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, NASA, they even put a mirror on top of you know, the moon so that you can get better reflectivity and then you can get uh, better values uh, for the distance to the moon. So we could say that you know, the distance to the moon is, is, is quite well measured, right? So it's about 384,000 kilometers. And that is about 10 times the circumference of the Earth. Okay, so now the question is, since it's about 10 times the circumference of the Earth, maybe it will take about three days to get to the moon, which is actually about right. Okay, which is, uh, so in 1969, Neil Armstrong, we, we know that he was the first person who, who stepped on the moon. He wasn't the first person on space, right? But he was the first person who actually got onto the moon. Who, who made a first footstep of mankind, you know? So in the Apollo 11 spacecraft, it took them about three days and four hours just to get into the orbit of the moon. Okay, mind you, they haven't landed yet. Huh? They just arrived at the moon and they're just orbiting around the moon. That takes three days. Okay? And then it takes another day for them to go around the moon and, and 24 hours. Okay? Another day to land on the moon itself. So that's how long, about four days, just to get to the moon. Okay, you must think, uh, these three people, there were three people on, on, on the, that probe. 
and all three of them are in a very small confined uh, uh, place you know so in this such confined place they are looking at each other for three days four days you staring at me me staring at you sitting like that for four days straight okay so that's how it feels like to travel all the way to the moon okay so since then there have been six man moon missions okay so uh, they have been sending people to the moon uh, uh, at least uh, six missions there and of course, uh, there are a lot of conspiracy theories, right? A lot of people say that uh, maybe this didn't happen. Maybe uh, NASA was, uh, they tried to fabricate some photos in order to win the Cold War, okay? So if you, let's say, if you really, really don't believe that, that people have been to the moon, fear not, because in a few years' time, China is actually wanting to, to do the same. They want to send people to the moon, because uh, why, why was there so long a gap that we have not sending uh, people to the moon? It's because of financial issues. And also because of uh, the interest of the science. I mean, what we want to do and what we want to know to the moon, right? So, I mean, if we can do a lot of science based on Earth, we don't need to travel to the moon. We save a lot of costs, right? So now that we have new technology, we have new things we want to study. Uh, so it is maybe it's another good time, a good period of time to send people back to the moon again and maybe collect some samples or do some drilling, you know, and all that. Okay, so this will happen in the next two years, maybe, right? In the next uh, one year or so. So it's, it's exciting to, to look out and to see another so-called, if some people think that it wasn't real in the past, this should be real this time, okay? That that should be really a real time that the people are going to the moon. Okay? So now we are going a bit further from there, okay? So now from the moon, we are going to the next planet that is closer to us. Okay, we are not going to Venus, okay? Because I think it's more interesting to talk about Mars, okay? Even though Mars is a bit slightly further, okay? So you should know your... Uh, uh, solar system, right? There are eight planets, uh, not nine planets, right? So uh, the fourth planet is Mars, right? So you can see that Mars is this very small dot over here. So now we are trying to measure the distance to Mars and also getting to Mars itself, okay? So the question is, how far and how long does it take to get to Mars, okay? So the shortest distance from Earth to Mars is about 54.6 million kilometers. Okay, that's quite a big distance uh, compared to what we have to the moon earlier on. But the question, the problem is this, okay, they, they are not stationary. Eh? All these planets are not just sitting around that you can just fly in a straight line to get there, right? They are orbiting around. So what happens is this, right? If you look at this picture, uh, I'm not sure if it's clear for you. So this is Earth and this is Mars. You see, they're actually moving in orbit, right? So you have to start off from there and then when you fly, you travel, you arrive here, right? So that means it's like you have to take into account the moving of two planets. So one planet is moving and then you have to take into account when you start flying from this point and then you reach there at that, at that certain point. So, so that means that distance will technically be longer between the minimum distance between two planets, right? Easy to understand, huh? So what happens is that that distance is actually much, much larger. It's about 485 million kilometers and that is considered the shortest way of getting to Mars itself. Okay, so how long do, will we be able to get there, you guess? It will take about six or seven months, and that's about half a year. Okay, once again, thinking of the, the three persons in the moon, and you're going to sit together with the other two persons for six months, looking at one another. Okay, so there's this joke that, that uh, some, some people say that, you know, uh, when you travel to, the, to, to Mars, right, uh, two men, you know, <coughs> they, they usually, they, they were like uh, homo, uh, heterosexual, but when they end up on the moon, they may end up homosexual. Okay, that's a joke, because there is a psychological thing that people are trying to, to study, you know. And, and it's actually true, huh? because when you confine two persons in, in or, or, or three persons or four persons in a very small space for six months without going out, without going anywhere, it's actually a very huge psychological constraint. There has been like uh, psychological uh, experiments. They tried, okay, they actually uh, tried to close uh, uh, four people or five people into one place and test whether see they can withstand six months or not. And, and all of these experiments so far, they have failed. Okay, none of them have succeeded. So that means that even traveling to Mars itself is going to be quite a challenge at the moment, psychologically. Okay, six months within a confined space with, with, with few people, that's not going to be an easy thing to do. Okay, but still it's, it's, it's interesting to know that, you know, it's still doable in the lifetime of a human, right? You can, within six months, uh, you, you can maybe bring a huge book or all your books, or whatever, to read, and by the six months, you can arrive there. It's still feasible, okay? And uh, in fact, recently, uh, in November 2018, the most recent uh, probe that went to Mars is uh, NASA's InSight, okay? What's special about InSight is that InSight is, uh, is a probe that is going to be doing some drilling, 
it's going to study uh, the internal structures of Mars because in the past we sent stuff there but we, we can't really drill much deeper into it so we, we can't really discover what exactly is inside or in fact uh, what we want to know in there. So this uh, probe just went there recently in November and then uh, there's still a lot of science that we expect to, to get out from this probe. Okay. Okay, now, so we want to go a bit further now, okay? So instead of going outwards, let's, why not, let's try going inwards, we go to the sun, okay? So how long does it take to get to the sun? Okay, first of all, Pluto is actually a dwarf planet that lives in the equator belt. So let's try to think of it. We are going to go from Earth all the way to Pluto. And by the way, those of you who don't know Pluto, recently we have a very beautiful image of Pluto, right? If, if, you, if you follow the news recently, and we found out that Pluto was red, Okay, in the past pictures we take, they're all grayish color, but when a close-up look, we found out that it's so beautiful, it's a red planet. Okay, so we are going there all the way to Pluto, and how far is Pluto? Pluto is about 40 astronomical units away from the Sun. So that means if you, there is one astronomical unit from the Earth to go to the Sun, that means it will take 40 times the distance to get all the way to Pluto. Right, so try to think of that, it's 40 times that, that 5 months uh, duration that you take to get there, all right? But obviously you can fly faster this time. Okay, you're, you're not going to fly with the same speed because you can make use of gravitational spins or like uh, gravitational assist that use uh, like large uh, planets to swing you into faster speeds. So you can actually reach Pluto uh, less be some other things beyond Pluto that also still is in the solar system, okay? So this hypothetical cloud is called the Oots cloud. Okay, if you, if you notice the distance here is in a log scale, so this ruler gets here at about 10,000 astronomical units. So that's a large leap compared to reaching to Pluto alone. So why do we think that there's a cloud here? It has something to do with the comets. Uh, basically, we, we see comets uh, coming into the solar system. We, we measure that you know they, they seem to be uh, about the same size, and then they, they don't seem to like decay and all that. So we think that maybe there is some cloud out there that actually replenishes the comet size and all that. So there must be some cloud out here that, that produces comets that comes in to, to near to the inner solar system. Okay, so funny thing is this, we think that it is there, but we are not sure if it is there. Okay, that means we have no any proof that physically that we have seen the wood cloud. Okay, that's, that's a very interesting thing that so far we know about the wood cloud. Okay, so assume that it exists. Okay, and assume that our theory is right, that there's such a cloud. Okay. So to get to the wood cloud is going to take many many years, okay? It's, 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 so so the, for for scale, huh? Voyager one was a, a probe that was sent in the 1970s. The the purpose of Voyager one is to take pictures of all the outer solar system uh, bodies, right? So like uh, Jupiter, Neptune, uh, Uranus, to take re really beautiful pictures and send them back. Obviously, at that time, the technology, it can only do that much. Okay, so after a while, Voyager 1 has to shut down everything. Nothing is going to work. So in, in other words, it's basically a piece of trash. Okay, it's like a space trash that's moving all the way out to the solar system that we hope that one day, some alien or someone will be able to find it and take it back to Earth. Lah. Okay, so it's interesting. People actually put some stuff on the probe lah, to, to tell people like, where are we, who are we, you know, that, that's a, some interesting things that you can read up. So anyway, Voyager 1 is on the way out of the solar system to deep space, okay? So how long will it get to, to the wood cloud? It will be there, uh, it will reach the wood cloud in about 300 years, okay? So not within a single human's lifetime, lah, okay? So and it can reach there in 300 years, it has lost all its function, it cannot take a picture for us, it cannot send signal back to us to tell us where it is, unfortunately, okay? So hopefully one day we will be able to save it, you know, and bring it back in, in, with newer technology. But we haven't finished the story, right? You can reach that in 300 years, but it takes another 30,000 years to get past the entire wood cloud. Okay, so that's like about 100 times the time it gets to get there. All right, so, so are you getting the, the, the picture now? So now we are more and more and more and more insignificant uh, in this entire story that we are going. And we're only at stage 5. That's stage 9, uh, by the way. Okay, we are, we are only halfway through. We, we cannot really reach there within in our lifetime. Okay? So are you ready? We are going to push even further now. Okay, now we are going out of the solar system. We want to go to the nearest star. Okay, so the nearest star that we have is a, a star called Proxima Centauri. So Proxima uh, uh, derives into the word proximity, so which is nearby. Centauri means that it's, it's basically in the direction of the constellation Centaurus. 
Okay, so at Alpha Centauri is a star system. There are actually three stars, there, and one of these stars is called uh, Proxima Centauri. So, if if you if you draw it out, it actually takes about three point something light years to get there. Okay, so now once again, uh, astronomical unit is not very practical. Okay, so we are going to use the word light year over here. So light year means uh, the the time for light to travel in one year. Okay, technically it's uh, 365.25 days. Okay, so that's the amount of time that you travel in light. So that means it takes about three years for light from uh, Proxima Centauri to reach Earth. That means if one day Proxima Centauri explodes, it will take three years for us to know that it exploded. Or in other words, if someone tried to send us a signal from Proxima Centauri, it will take us three years to receive. So it's like an a email exchange of three year light. Okay, so that, that's quite, quite a big distance over there. So in other words, in, at this point of time, uh, it's still feasible to connect to someone. It's still feasible to talk to someone there, but it's not feasible to get there because it takes, just now already, it's, it takes about 30,000 years to get there. Right? So you still can communicate, still feasible, okay, within a few years' time. So I didn't explain how do we measure distances, how do we know it's, it's this light year. We cannot use laser anymore because laser is, is, is so far away, it takes three years for you to get it bounced back, number one. Number two, if it bounced back, it would be so weak that we probably wouldn't even detect it. Okay, we probably wouldn't even know whether we detect it or not. So the, the one way that people do is using stellar parallax. Okay, how stellar parallax works is this. If you take up your thumb, okay, so you compare, if you look at your thumb using your two eyes, okay, and then uh, with respect to a, a very far background, right? So if you close one eye and you close the other eye, you will notice that your thumb is covering two different things, right? So okay, if now if let's say I, I'm covering this cup, right? So when I close one eye, my, my, my finger will now be covering the right-hand side of the cup. But when I close my left eye, my thumb is now on the left-hand side of the cup. Okay, so this is a geometrical method, a trigonometry method that we try to measure distances to stars. So how is it done? It's basically, we take a baseline. Uh, when Earth is on this side of the sun, we measure the, the, the position of the star with respect to something that's behind it, that's so far away. And then when we get to this six months later, when we get here, once again, we look at the same star, and then we look at the position again. Okay, so with these two positions, we can get an angle, and then with that angle, we can measure the rough distance of, uh, you know, uh, from the sun to that star itself, okay? And we call it the parsec, PC, okay? So one parsec is about 206,000 uh, 206, uh, astronomical units. Okay, so we sometimes we use light years and sometimes we use parsec. So the key thing is this, light years are usually used in popular science. That means when you uh, try to uh, tell to the public, light years is more understandable. But for astronomy, we need to use another uh, unit which is parsec, which is more feasible and more easier to, to work in for, for scientific purposes. Okay, but for the sake of this talk, I will try to use light years so that you, you can, uh, uh, it's easier to understand like, from, from, from your point of view. Okay, so we can measure distances to stars, and uh, mind you, these are nearby stars. Okay, remember I mentioned that that's background with respect to background. That means all those background stars we cannot measure using this method. All right. So we 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 need to get to Proxima Centauri. Uh, why why do we think it's interesting to get there? Because we found an exoplanet that's there. Okay, a planet that is about the size of Earth and that is possibly habitable. That means maybe. It, is, it seems like it's, it's uh, conducive for life. It looks like it, like, so far as we think it is. Okay, so uh, there is a planet there. And then uh, there are actually plans of uh, trying to figure out what, how can we get there in a quicker time. So this is an ongoing research. In fact, by the, uh, the ESO, the uh, European Southern Observatory, they're actually trying to, to do something to launch a probe that can reach there, uh, let's say, in about 70 years' time. Okay, by that time, I uh, have been retired, so it'll be you guys you know, who are going to work out how are we actually going to send a probe there in a human's lifetime. Okay? I mean, we hope that, in that by in 10 years' time, we can, we can cut down the, the technology to reach there in like, uh, no less than 100 years or so. Okay? That is a technology that we are waiting to, to see a breakthrough of. Okay? Not, in, not impossible. There are methods, there are things that we can work to, but the only thing is that whether the theory and the you know, the practical can actually merge together and create something that can reach there in our lifetime. Otherwise, you know, we all we can do is just look at it. Okay, we can only look at this planet. We don't know if there's anything there, and you know, we don't even know if we can uh, leave Earth and, and conquer another planet in the future. Okay, 
and we are still just at stage six. We haven't we haven't gone uh, seven, eight, and nine yet. Okay, so let's continue. How about that? Now, we are going further from the star. We want to go to the edge of our galaxy. Okay. So for those of you who don't know, we live in a galaxy. Okay. What is a galaxy? A galaxy is a it's like a basically a system of billions of stars. So there are so many stars that when you look out from a very very distance, you see all these stars come together and they look basically something like that, lah. So this is the shape of a spiral galaxy. That means they have uh, specifically spiral uh, shapes. Okay, and if you can see those of you who are near, you can see that the Sun and Proxima Centauri are just two dots that are very close by in one portion of the galaxy. Okay, so if I want to get out of this galaxy itself, I need to travel all the way to the end, and and sometimes it's difficult to 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 measure where exactly the end of the galaxy is. And by the way, for those of you who, who wonder how do we know we live in a galaxy, you can actually see the Milky Way at night. Okay? But, but you have to go to a very, very dark place. You will see that there will be one streak in the sky that is very bright stars and, and uh, bright, bright lights. Okay? So what is that? That's basically we looking through like the plane of the galaxy. So imagine that we are inside the galaxy. Right? It looks like a disk like this. So we are looking at one direction. So we see like this entire strip of white stuff in the sky. Okay, that's the reason why it's called Milky Way. Lah. Okay, so Milky Way, as in it looks milky and it looks like a way. Okay, anyone knows what's Milky Way called in Malay? Bima Sakti. Eh? I used to think it was called Laluan Susu because it makes more sense. Right? So it's actually Bima Sakti. Okay, that's the Milky Way. Alright? So yeah, it looks like this in the sky. Okay, if you have a camera that, that, that scans the sky for a long time, you can actually get a good picture of uh, of uh, the, the Milky Way, and you can go to like very dark places in Australia or you know like in the desert, and you can really see very beautiful pictures of that. Okay, there are stars in there, but the problem is because they are blocked by the light of the Milky Way, so sometimes we it's, it's much difficult to observe within this plane. So a lot of science uh, that we do that we study we study the stars that are outside of this this plane, so we look like on the other sides there are darker skies. Okay. Okay, that's a very good question. So, how do we know that it's spiral, right? Because we, from our direction, we we can only see this. So it may well be a square. It may well be a circle. It may be elliptical. Okay. So how do we know that it's based on some sort of uh, radio uh, radio techniques? So sometimes you can you can measure through. So when you when you point at different parts of of this of the the Milky Way. Okay, you can actually detect uh, what kind of, uh, how to say, uh, uh, the material that is there based on spectroscopy. La. So I'm not going to go deep into that, but there are signatures that can tell you uh, what is within the black stuff and what is within the white stuff. Okay, so by, by measuring the concentration of these stuff, and you compare with the theory that we think that, okay, if it's an elliptical with, without this kind of bars, we can tell the difference based on the, the, the data that we have alone. So we conclude basically based on hydrogen uh, atoms in, in the universe, uh, based on hydrogen atoms within this galaxy, you can say that it's relatively confident that it's a spiral galaxy. Lah. Okay, but of course then again, spiral galaxies have different types. Okay, there are some with bars, there are some with like uh, different, we, we classify spiral galaxies into different types as well. So, but that would be a bit more dodgy. We are not quite sure about that. Okay, so but uh, yeah, does that answer your question? All right, okay. Okay, I'll continue. Huh? So there are about the 100 to 4 billion stars within the Milky Way itself. So there's a lot of stars. We are, we are traveling all the way to the end of the Milky Way. And the width of the Milky Way, that means uh, from, from, from the, the, the diameter itself is about 150 to 200 kilo light years, 1,000 light years. Okay, so once again, that's a very large number. You take 200,000 years to get for, for light to travel all the way from, from there to there. Okay, and fun fact, uh, you probably heard about the recent news, right, about the, the discovery, I mean, the, the, the picture of the black hole, right? So you may be wondering that how, how come it takes so long for them to take a picture of a black hole, right? I mean, just, just think about it. I mean, there is a black hole in the middle of the, the solar system, uh, sorry, in, within the Milky Way, right? So technically, if you look directly to the center of the, the, the galaxy, you would expect to see the black hole there, right? But the problem is this, it's blocked away by all this light that's outside of it, okay? They're block, blocked out by all those light, the dust and everything. So you, even though you're looking at the di right direction, you wouldn't be able to see it. You can see it through radio waves, okay? Radio waves can penetrate it through, but the problem is a black hole is so small, 
So even though you can use radio waves, you can't see where exactly where that dot is. So that's where the, the recent technology comes in, where it uses uh, many, many telescopes, and then as, as large as the size of the Earth, to, to, to really like break down the resolution to this small, one small little dot to, to resolve that, that black hole. So in other words, it is there, it's that direction, we all know that, but just that like it takes such a big effort to take a picture of a very small black hole, right? So, so that means it's, it's, it, we, we can conceive a lot of things that we, we, we look out there, they may be there, but it's just that they are too small for us to discover. Okay, so that's why the distance scale, as we go up now, it's, it's going to be, uh, we, we measure distances in, in a very like uncertain way. We, we can't really measure them up to a certain uh, uncertainty as we can measure things within a solar system, all right? And even that, that plus minus how many thousands of, uh, of, of light years is also good enough for us to do science, all right? Okay, so, uh, uh, so yeah, there's a black hole, it's called Sagittarius A star in the middle of uh, the Milky Way. And, and the picture that you saw online is uh, the M M seventy six eighty seven yeah okay that was M eighty seven it's another uh, black hole in another galaxy okay not the one that we are, that's closest to us okay so it actually tells you something and that that black hole is actually much 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 larger than this one here that we can actually get a better picture of that one than the nearer black hole okay so this is. We just know we were still within our galaxy. Now we are going out of our galaxy to the nearest galaxy. Okay? There are many nearby galaxies, but I'd like to talk about the Andromeda galaxy. Andromeda galaxy is a, a very popular galaxy that, that people talk about. Okay? So we want to measure the distance to the galaxy now because now it's, it's, uh, we, we cannot use the parallax errors and, and all that. How do we do that? Okay? Uh, I, I'm not going to go into detail. But generally, what we can do is by theory, by, by studying the properties of stars, and, and uh, we relate the luminosity with the size, with the mass, with the temperature, and all these things can help us to give us like a scale. Okay? That means if we expect we see a star that looks like this, that, that acts like this, and, and you know, heats up like this, and we put it in a different place, in a further place, it will have a, we, we can calculate that difference in that, that brightness and, and the properties and the size and everything. And with that, we can scale up and it gives us like a ruler, you know, we call it a, or rather a candle, it's like a candle moving further, further and away from us, and then with that we can actually measure distances to galaxies, okay? So just now we talk about radar, we talk about stellar parallax, and this tree over here that I won't go into detail about, spectroscopic parallax, variable stars and all that, are basically methods that we can use to measure distances to galaxies, okay? So I'm not going to go into detail, but generally it's doable, it can be done. Okay, so with that distance measurements to galaxies being done, we know that we can measure the distance to Andromeda. Okay, so that means Andromeda, by, by these calculations, we found out that it's about 2.54 million light years away, mega light years, okay, from the Milky Way, from the center of the Milky Way. So now when we measure distances out there, whether is it from the Milky Way center or whether is it from the Earth, from the Sun, it doesn't matter because it's so far away, right? They're about the same distance. Huh? So we just say a general distance of 2.54 mega light years away, okay? So I, I'm not sure if you can see the picture. So we can actually take pictures of Andromeda. It looks something like this. And if you notice the difference of this shape compared to our Milky Way, it's what we call as an elliptical galaxy. That means it's, uh, there's no spiral shapes that you can see involved. Like. Okay? And in the sky, it looks something like that, okay? You, you won't be able to see it this bright because it's a very faint object. But if you if you brighten it up about hundred or thousand times, it looks quite big. In fact, in the sky, okay, it's, it's one of the biggest uh, extended objects that we can see on the sky. Okay. So if you, so the question is, how, how long does it get for us to, to get to two point five four mega light years away? So it's it's uncountable. Uh, we we don't want to think of that because it's probably not feasible. But even if we don't want to try to go to Andromeda. The good news is this, Andromeda is actually coming to us. Okay, it's actually in a collision course with the Milky Way galaxy. So within 4 billion years, our chuchu punya chichit punya chuchu chichit, they will be able to see Andromeda coming closer and closer and closer. Okay, so how does it look like? This is a simulation, all right? Uh, you can see that, uh, let, me, let me restart again. So this is Andromeda, this is Milky Way, this is another galaxy called Triangulum. So you see, uh, it's, it, as time passes by, they're going to pass by, and they're going to rotate around one another. They're going to swoosh, they're going to go to each other, 
and Triangulum Galaxy is just going to pass by, say hi, and it's going to go away, and then they're going to come back again, right? And then they will eventually combine and become one single galaxy in, in how many years' time? In 4 billion years' time, okay? So by that time, we need a new name, now. we need to call it uh, Milky Andromeda Way or, or like Andro, Andro Milky Way, something like that, okay? We need a new name for, for that, that kind of uh, stuff. So uh, an artist from NASA actually tried to tried to uh, visualize this. Uh. So imagine that now this is the Milky Way. We can see the bar, and we can see Andromeda Galaxy over here. Okay. So we fast forward one billion years later. It's going to look quite huge, right? The Andromeda is getting closer to us. And then at that time, you bring your girlfriend out. It's going to be so romantic. Wow! Look at the Andromeda Galaxy. You know, it's so so cute. But after another billion years, it's going to be too big, right? You know, it's like it's it's too scary out there. So it's not romantic anymore. Right, it's going to be so huge that you actually see like two, two galaxy, uh, you know, like bright star, bright lights on the sky. And let's fast forward another billion years. It's going to be like a mess. Okay, it's going to be, but like so much light in the sky that night time is going to be like day. Okay, and then it's going to be like this. Huh? Four billion years. So we're we we're going to be all mashed together. So you want to ask the question? Technically, yes, because uh, uh, the, first of all, we, we believe that the lifetime of the sun is about 5 billion years. Long. But then again, when, when, when the sun grows up, uh, we are going to get burned. Uh, so, so we are going to get burned much pretty soon, uh, unless we can move to Mars or something, you know, and, and create an atmosphere there and continue to live. Uh, but this is what we think uh, it will look like, uh, if, if assuming that uh, the distance of the galaxy comes to us. Okay? So where were we? we? We now we are going to the final stage. Okay, we, we have tried to reach the nearest galaxy, but mind you, there are so many thousands, billions, gazillions of galaxies involved that we, we haven't even talked about the furthest galaxy, right? So we found out that the universe is actually accelerating. That means it's constantly expanding, larger and larger and larger. So that means uh, up to that point, if you want to measure a distance beyond Andromeda. You need to use something else. We need to use what we call as the uh, uh, cosmological redshift. Okay, because we know that the universe is accelerating, there will be a shift in the spectra that we see when we look at all these galaxies. We need like very high powered, uh, like you know, uh, very large telescopes to measure their spectra, and then we measure the shift of the spectra, and with that spectra itself, how much it shifts, and then we, we measure how far they are away from us. Okay, so uh, this is. The, the basically the furthest uh, distance measurement that we, the two we can have and we, we it's, it's hard to translate redshift into distance now because uh, it depends on the model of, of the science that you use the cosmological model so when we do science in cosmology when we study galaxies in this region you know we it, it has to be in redshifts okay so the furthest galaxy that we detected it's called uh, MAC, uh, this, this number, whatever it is. It is located at a redshift of about 10.7. Okay, so we, we denote redshift as Z. Okay, just uh, for, for information, uh, the redshift of Andromeda is like negative 0. Point something. So the reason it's negative is because it's moving towards Earth. Huh? So even the nearby galaxies, we can measure them as uh, Z equals to 0. 0.00 something. Okay, so it's very, very small value. So this number 10, it means that it's so far away and also very very ancient because it's so so far before i mean it takes how many uh, millions or billions of years for the light to reach us and so we are looking at ancient galaxies over here and if you look closely this is a blob huh? this is an actual picture of of that that galaxy that we are seeing you see that it's just pixelated right it's basically made up of about nine pixels yeah uh, 12 pixels or so right that is the best image that we can get of this galaxy so it gives you an idea of how far we can go and this is most likely the furthest or, or that we can go now, okay, that we can take now. How far can we go after that depends on how well we can develop our equipment. Okay? So of course it's not the highest redshift that we can ever find. There's there's also other things that we can detect. But that goes very, very theoretical. And and I'm pro I'm not gonna go through that. But one thing you can think about is what we call as a cosmic microwave background radiation. This is a radiation that we, uh, by using the Big Bang model, we, we, we postulate to be a radiation that comes far away from almost uh, to, towards the beginning of the universe. And this radiation is at a redshift of 1100. It's, it's so far away compared to that 10, uh, 10 redshift. Okay? And this, this is a, like a background temperature that we, we scan everywhere across the sky. It's 3 kelvins. That's about minus 270 degrees Celsius. 
And there are a lot of interesting implications on this because we realize that everywhere we look out the, at the sky, when we minus all the, the starlight, sunlight, everything, we, we still get about around three. Okay? And if there is actually fluctuation, that's 3.000 is about one, one millionth of a change, you know. So it's, it's very, almost very isotropic. That means it's the, the variation is very different, but still, there is some variation. So scientists like to push it further. They, they want to ask questions like, why is there still a million of, you know, like a, a, a variation in this temperature, wherever sky, which part of we, we, we point? So these are also active researchers, like trying to, to figure out why and, and, and to take better pictures of the Earth with, with higher resolution to see if there's actually another pattern that we can see. Okay? This is not the end yet, okay? The end that we can see is basically the age of the observable universe. Okay, so we, I need to add the word observable here because this is the, the, the age that we can see now. That means within the, the so-called beginning of the universe until now, this is the maximum length that we can see based on how light travels at the light speed. So that means there is something beyond this sphere that we draw as the observable universe. There may be a giant monster there, but we cannot see it okay, any, any time soon because it's basically information has not come through yet. It hasn't come here yet. Maybe there's a wall here, or maybe there's God there putting his hand there to, to stop it. You don't know because we cannot see it. Okay, so that means every science that we can make sense out of has to be within this sphere. Nothing that you talk about outside of this sphere makes sense because that is not uh, something that we can measure. So we are interested to know like how long does this uh, observable universe expands and how does the physics within it do? Okay, maybe one day it would expand to a part where we realize there's a wall or something or not. We don't know. Lah. But for now, all we can focus is, is all the science that's within that. Okay, and this measurement of the radius is about 46 giga light years. So that's the, possibly the largest radius. Uh, you double that, that's about 90, uh, uh, 92. So that's probably the largest number of distance that you can have in the entire universe. Okay, that's the end of the story. We, we cannot go any further because any further is futile. We, we, there's nothing you can get out of it. Lah. Okay, so you can see that how small we are. We are, we are so, so deep inside this, this entire universe that we, we, even if we are here or here, it doesn't matter because we are so small. All right, that, 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 this is, this is the, the end of, of what we can, you can get. Okay, so what, what can you get out of this, this talk today? Okay, first of all, you realize that you're so small, you're so tiny, that things just don't matter. No? We're, we're in such a small universe, right? We, we are so, we are probably won't be going anywhere further than Mars in the next 10 years. So we may be sending people to Mars to try to see uh, whether we can uh, grow crops or we can, we can try to create artificial atmosphere or we can try to uh, start a colony there, but maybe not further than Mars. All right, so there are a lot of uh, interesting stories about how people are thinking of sending people to Mars. And... Most people think that it will be a one-way trip. That means once you go there, it's unlikely that they will fetch you and come back. And there's a reason for that. Because when you go there, the, the gravity there is going to be much lesser. Okay. So if, let's say you stayed in Mars for two years, because it takes uh, the, the, the shuttle for two years round to come back again. So, so it takes six months to get there, to Mars, and then it goes back again. Or maybe that the shuttle just go there, and but we have to send food and everything for the second round, right? We need to wait for another two years for this same short distance to occur again to send. So that means it's like every two years you send someone there, okay? So let's say if you go there two years, you live there for two years, and you decide to come back to Earth, you have already adapted to the Martian gravity, and when you come back to Earth, your bones will actually crush yourself to death, okay? Because you cannot withstand the gravity that is on Earth, okay? So that's the reason why. We may be able to travel to Mars, but it will be a one-way trip. We are going to forego everything that you have on Earth, and you are going to start life anew on Mars. All right. So there are so many things to wait for us uh, to explore in the future, and it really depends on the breakthrough in, in the, the material and uh, whatever technology that we have in order to get there. Okay. So our, our Earth is in fact so tiny in the scale of the universe. Now. So so in, you can think of it that way that our life is so insignificant compared to this huge uh, uh, universe that was created, right? But then again, I want you to think of it the other way, okay? Your life is so small, so insignificant, so is your problems, 
Okay, the soul is a problem that you are facing in life. You may be experiencing depression, your, your exam very hard to do, but you must think in the cosmic point of view, right? All these things are also so very small. So every time when you try to think of your problems being so big, you cannot do it, you cannot uh, graduate, you cannot finish your assignment, you must think of it that way, okay? We are but small, pe small things uh, on earth, and our problems are just tiny, mini things that we can do. If there is a God existing out there, He is so much, so much more bigger, right? And if there isn't, of course, you're free to believe whatever you want. But, right, so, so you must understand that this, in that scale, everything is small. Your problems are small, so are your achievements. So, so live a life, you know, treasure your life every day. You don't take it for granted. This is something that, you know, you should really uh, live to your fullest. Uh, and don't get, let tiny, weeny things, problems stop you from, you know, achieving your dreams. Okay? So, that's all I have uh, for today. Uh, thank you so much. And... <coughs> Uh, yes, uh, anyone has uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, since the universe is uh, the universe expansion is accelerating, uh, shouldn't the redshift uh the targeting be removed and the observation should be shifting instead of Okay, so that's a very good question. Okay, so when we say the expansion of the universe it's actually the expansion of space. Okay, so uh, I, I don't want you to think of it as like Earth getting fatter and fatter. Okay, the Earth actually remains the same size, but the space itself is getting larger and larger. So okay, let's say you 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 say that there's a there's a photon that comes from the this uh, the end of the universe. Okay, so it's moving towards us, but as it moves towards us, the space expands. Okay, what happens to this photon is it doesn't get pushed back, you know. It actually is still moving, but there is a loss of energy. And the loss of energy is found in the red shift, which is the shifting from maybe it was, it started off with a gamma ray, then it's, the energy loses, it becomes, let's say, an ultraviolet light. And then when it reaches Earth, it's probably a radio wave. Okay, so there is some sort of science involved there. So the red shift is the change in the energy of the photon coming through. It's still moving at the same speed, but the expansion of space causes it to be different. So in, in one sense, yes, the red shift is actually constant. For, for this object in the same expansion, right? unless the expansion is different. Okay, so of course, uh, there are actually theories that the, the expansion of the universe was not constant in the past. Okay, we, we have this inflation theory saying that in the beginning there was a big bang and then zoom, suddenly it increases so large in order for some things to communicate. Lah. Okay, it's, it's a bit uh, difficult to explain here, but so suddenly there's an expansion and it constantly expands in a constant, in, in the accelerator rate with a fixed acceleration rate. Lah. It's not like uh, uh, accelerating accelerator rate kind of thing. Lah. Okay, so with that rate in that in hand, and it's, it's going to be there at this rate for, let's say, a few billion years. You know? So in that sense, whether you measure it today or you measure it five years later, it's about the same. But it will make a difference. If in a thousand, uh, let's say a, a million years time, you measure this this expansion rate, it may be different. Yeah, but for for general purposes, what we know is this: this rate shift is okay. It's a good measure now. We we can make a lot of science out of it based on uh, measurements that we have today. Okay. Any question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in the past, in the same, so if you are talking about uh, so distances, yeah. One thing I didn't go into is that if you're talking about the exact distances, technically they are in increasing. Okay, remember I mentioned that there, there's there is an expansion. So technically, if you if you if you have a fixed ruler, that expansion is actually increasing. Okay, but that is what we call as uh, the the co-moving distance. Uh, so sorry. Uh, so so we're actually interested in the co-moving distance. That means the moving distance based on the coordinates that we live in, which is. Or in other words, we are saying that the coordinates are expanding. So, so it was 1 cm was like that, 2, 1 cm is like that in 1000 years time, something like that. So we are, we are, we are actually fixing to this uh, co-moving coordinates instead of the so-called proper distance that will change in how many thousand million years. Alright, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Some even more is expanding faster as we uh, okay, yes, you're, you're, you're right. So, so you're, you're right to say that some parts of the space, I mean, that you're looking now, uh, is actually moving faster than the speed of light. You're right, okay? But then again, uh, that doesn't mean that information is transferred to you faster than the speed of light. Because the, the speed of light is a limit where information can be transferred. So the only thing that is, you know is, is, trans, is, is expanding is the space. 
but the space does not give you any extra information even though it's expanding at that rate. You get what I mean? Yeah? Okay, so so there will be a chance. Actually, uh, you are you are right in the sense that there will be a chance if we get our measurements correctly. Okay, so uh, there is also uh, yeah I didn't talk about the ending of the universe, right? So there are multiple pen endings that can happen. Okay, one possible scenario is that it accelerates until a certain place it stops, it decelerates, and then it crashes again to a singularity. That can happen. Okay, another way is it continues to accelerate just like it is. Okay, the same, the same rate all the way until infinity. And another one is it will accelerate faster and faster and faster such that everything will be just torn apart. That means this space expansion is so fast until that you can drag even that light cannot escape. So you're right, there is a scenario that can happen. So what, what that, that will cause a big freeze. That means everything is just so torn apart that the, the temperature of the entire universe will just drop to zero Kelvin. So that's why we call it a big freeze. That means the entire ending of, of that. Lah. So, so actually scientists are interested in, in the study of like what will the ending be. Okay, but uh, generally we, 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 we measure, we study, we don't think that it will rebound. We don't think that it will expand and it will stop. We don't think it's going to expand and stop at a certain value. We think that it's going to expand continuously. Lah. Yeah, that's what we think. From, from what I understand from this question is that the photon cannot reach us because the universe is expanding. I thought that photon should be behind the uh, observable universe, right? Oh, so so you, yeah, you're saying that the that, that photon has, has already passed our our sphere of observability. You mean as the universe expands? Yeah. Uh, what I understand is that as our universe expands, then more and more stuff is behind. So that means the photon can never reach us again. The photon oh, can never reach us. Yeah, actually, it, it can happen. Yeah, yeah, right. So that there, there's this uh, Obers paradox as well, but that's a uh, the other way around is saying that if, if you if you think that uh, the universe continues to expand, that means you will be able to see more and more stars, right? So more and more light. And since every every direction that you see, you know, there'll be more stars involved. So one day in the future universe, you will see like you know there'll be all stars. That means it will be night night sky will be full of stars. But this is negated due to the fact that the universe is accelerating. So it sort of like stops some things from reaching us within a certain time frame, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Okay. Now it's impossible to travel from, I mean, from here to Mars or how is it are we going to travel? I mean, in future, like, is it possible to travel faster than light or something like this? Space travel, I mean, I think I mentioned a lot of it. It's not possible. Like,